Elena, we have to talk about Gladys. Do we ever? Welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and well, this episode was not the episode I had planned. Episode three of Keep the Bastards Honest was supposed to be me chatting with two of our incredible young Democrats, but we were overtaken by events, dear boy, events, as British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan has been credited with saying. On Friday, 1st of October, 2021, New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian suddenly resigned from both her role as Premier and as a member of the New South Wales Parliament after the Independent Commission Against Corruption announced that they were opening an investigation into whether she had breached the public trust during her dealings with her then secret boyfriend and corrupt former MP Dara Maguire. My ever-reliable Democrats colleague Steve Beatty stepped in at short notice to have a chat about the resignation of his state's Premier and the different standards of accountability between state and federal governments the Berejiklian's resignation has revealed. I'm recording this on Wadjuk country and Steve joined me from Gadigal country. We pay our respects to the traditional owners of these lands and their elders past and present. Sovereignty never ceded. Let's deal with the fact, first off, that another Liberal Party Premier of New South Wales has been, I won't say forced to resign, but has has taken the step of resigning from their role in response to the announcement of an ICAC investigation into alleged acts of public misconduct, breach of uh, public trust, potential corruption, conflicts of interest, the list goes on, and it's quite a list of topics that ICAC are investigating. Gladys Berejiklian yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon announced her resignation 30 minutes or so after ICAC put out their notice that they would be investigating her. Wow. And, like, isn't it, like, three now? That you- We've had three. Yeah. We've had three. The last one was Barry O'Farrell. And yes. for all of his quirks and faults, ultimately, ICAC were investigating a gift of a bottle of Penfolds Grange, valued at around $6,000. The gift was given to him. He didn't declare it as, you know, like in his declaration of interests. It wasn't that he received a gift. It was that he didn't declare it seem to mislead the commission when they asked about it, you know, and who hasn't received a $6,000 bottle of wine and forgotten that it was there? I'm in the process of moving house. No doubt when I go through the process of packing away the bottles of wine, I'll find a $6,000 bottle of wine, you know, hidden away somewhere that somebody gave me that I, I neglected to recall. I mean, it happens to all of us, right? Oh, yeah. You know, I can't tell you the number of bottles of wine that I've been gifted that I have probably forgotten to declare. Oh, that turned out to be worth, you know, five or $6,000. Yes, That's I right. Mean, it, it, exactly right. Barry O'Farrell was also the Premier, though, responsible for the approval of James Packer's um, Crown Casino um, large glittering um, phallic symbol at Barangaroo on public land, which uh, good people of Sydney and New South Wales uh, refer to as Packer's Pecker. <laughs> not only was it not asked for, not warranted, wasn't part of the initial plan, but was put through as an unsolicited bid after Alan Jones of Radio Fame and and now Sky News broker the lunch with James Packer and the then Premier. It was uh, Barry O'Farrell who had the idea that what Packer needed to do was submit this unsolicited bid. It turned out that the current rules governing unsolicited bids wouldn't allow for a submission 
like what Packer had in mind. And so O'Farrell put through a change to the legislation to allow it to go through. Not long afterwards, Packer's submission was put in and lo and behold, Sydney ends up with a six-star casino from an operator who was subsequently deemed to be too corrupt to allow to operate a casino, not only in New South Wales, but now potentially in both uh, Victoria and West Australia as well. That Barry O'Farrell, but it was the bottle of wine that did him in. That was our last, our like our previous premier that got done by ICAC. There was another one, which we don't need to go into, but Barry O'Farrell was seven years ago. It occurred in April 2014. We then had Mike Baird, and now we've got Gladys Berejiklian, and we no longer have Gladys. And I'm assuming that New South Wales is now in a state of mourning over the loss of, of your fearless leader. If you were <laughs> to read the various statements that have come out from Liberal Party politicians, from media uh, figures, you would think that Gladys had resigned or stepped down due to illness or family matters or to deal with the breakup of a marriage or the death of a child or something. All this outpouring of support, what a wonderful custodian she's been, what a wonderful servant she's been, what a hard fighter she's been and a campaigner for the good of New South Wales. Oh, and by the way, she stepped down under the shadow of a corruption inquiry, barely gets a mention. It's astonishing because, as you know, I'm over here in the uh, freedom-loving, independent, sovereign nation of Australia under the careful and loving management of Supreme Leader for Life, Mark McGowan. So looking at it as an outsider, it is really mind-boggling that th I, I think it's safe to say that three things can be true at the same time. At the first three truth, in this case, yes. That's yeah. right, at least three. So the first truth is that... New South Wales losing its premier in the middle of, you know, my bias is going to show, but what I'm going to call your COVID crisis is a devastating blow to that state. I mean, that is the last thing New South Four Wales time. needs with yes. everything you've got going on. So yes. fair cop, that, that is yes. true. Yes. What's also true is that a premier resigning under the cloud of a corruption investigation is doing the right thing by resigning. Her position was untenable. Yeah, that part's like really clear. Yep. Yeah. And the third thing is that's also true is that New South Wales is being grossly badly served by the media in their hand wringing and eulogising of Gladys as this fantastic leader who has been inconveniently undone by a little bit of corruption. I mean, that's garbage. I, I, I agree with you. There's definitely a lot going on there. Lots of things can be true at once. We do seem to be seeing a continuation of this normalisation of corruption. Where it's occurred in the past, the, the conduct that uh, Gladys is under investigation for goes back to a period between 2012 and 2018, a time when she was transport minister and treasurer, I think, were the two roles. Um, she was in a relationship with another MP, the MP for the Riverina, Daryl Maguire. That relationship was undisclosed. She was in a position where she was making financial decisions around grant funding in a number of significant areas that would benefit him politically. And she also, it seems, turned a blind eye to business dealings of his that were also corrupt, that would benefit him personally, which she chose not only not to disclose, but also to say to him, listen, I don't need to hear about that kind of thing. Uh, thank you very much. In all of that, it's, it's only a week ago or maybe two weeks ago that you and I were talking about Christian Porter. We were talking about the way in which his conduct, receiving money of an undisclosed amount from an undisclosed source, he stepped down from his position in Cabinet so as to avoid disclosing who those people were, but has not resigned as a federal MP and is basically, you know, in the words of Barnaby Joyce, sitting in the naughty corner for a few months until he can get back into the Cabinet. There's a stark contrast there, and I think resigning 
and resigning from both the Premiership and from Parliament was absolutely the right thing for Berejiklian to do. There have been calls for her to stand down since her relationship became apparent 12 months ago. We'll come back and talk about why she may have been able to stare down those calls for the last 12 months. But the actual resignation part, kudos. You know, like that was absolutely the appropriate thing to do. And it really highlights, I think, the difference between the state-level government scene in terms of accountability and, as we like to say, keeping the bastards honest, versus the federal government scene where there is no ICAC and there is no mechanism to keep those particular bastards honest. And it is astonishing to me the, okay, sort of the political class is one thing to be dissing ICAC and and implying that some kind of drag on um, good governance, which like it totally is not. It is a mechanism to ensure we have good government. But the media class buying into that narrative is astonishing. Yeah. It's one thing to say to somebody, this is a disappointing end to a career that has had its highlights. And we hope that ultimately she'll be cleared by the investigation, by the Independent Commission Against Corruption. Fine. You know, like express that point of view. But the idea that, oh, the timing was terrible, as though the the ICAC is sort of sitting there waiting for its, its best chance to its moment to pounce kind of thing. It's not at all. You can see from the history of the the New South Wales ICAC, they make announcements about upcoming uh, hearings on the 1st of the month. Right. And they did theirs on the 1st. So the investigation into Darren Maguire, uh, Gladys's boyfriend at the time, for around whom a lot of this swirls, occurred on the 21st of September 2020. It was announced on the 1st of September. We will be conducting public hearings into this matter on this date, at this time, and it's released at midday on the 1st of the month. And that's the way they operate. It's not like they sort of chose their moment to attack when she was most vulnerable. It was just the 1st of October. And the hearing was going to be held in October, and so they announced it. And the idea that ICAC should, I don't know, either suspend its hearings or pause the announcement to be at a more politically convenient time would have the very same media who is calling ICAC inconvenient and politicised now, you know, calling ICAC inconveniently politicised. ICAC must be, it's in the name, it is the independent. The first word, even. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So its schedule does not bow to political necessity. No. I I wish I was better remembering who said certain things, but somebody said that if people in power are allowed to get a pass because of an emergency, then they will manufacture an emergency in order to get a pass. Like So ICAC and bodies like them, whether it's the National Audit Office or the Ombudsman or any of those oversight bodies, have to act in the absence of political considerations, and that includes bad timing. Well, this is it. I mean, and yes, the pandemic is horrifically bad timing, but we are still going to have a federal election at some point between now and and May next year, regardless of the state of the pandemic, because otherwise suspending that election or delaying that election is also suspending our free and fair democracy. And if you allow that precedent to be set, then a other wholly manufactured emergency can arise. Next thing we have dictators for life. Uh, independence of groups like ICAC revolve around their ability to simply get on with their job and not worry about those sorts of things. Not worry about the election cycle, not worry about the budget cycle, not worry about the, the latest crisis, just to present their evidence as they formulate it, to make their announcements on their own schedule when they announce them and to go about their business in, a, in an orderly fashion, which is what it appears like they're doing here. Mm. And I, I think you, it, there's also an argument that it's literally an imperative that they get on with it regardless of the budget or political yeah. cycle. Think about it in, in the, the flip side, you know, like is now the time for us to remove the Premier 
Well, A, we didn't remove her. She stepped down because there's a, an investigation into whether or not she might be corrupt. But again, in an emergency, do we really want to be led by a corrupt politician? Mm. If yeah. you know that that's what's going on, isn't that something that you should address straight away to make sure that the way you're being run is actually above board? Absolutely. I mean, this notion that ICAC has somehow forced Gar- uh, Gladys to resign or sacked her it's it's a complete furphy because yeah. it is 100% her choice. She could have chosen to stay as Premier in the role and face this down the way she did 12 months ago and yeah. let the ICAC investigation run in the background and hang over the government's head for however long it took to play out. And if she proved was proven to be innocent, and at the moment we have to assume that she is because innocent before, you know, until proven guilty, she could have been vindicated in, in 12 or 18 months time from now and carried on as as the highly acclaimed fearless leader that the media wants to tell us that she is. You know, no one no one forced her. She, I mean, she resigned under the slightest pressure from the media when this came out. As you said, it was half an hour after it hit, uh, after the ICAC That's announcement hit the press. Yeah. So the, the, the press gallery didn't even have time to... Nobody, there was nobody paying for her to resign. You know, there was enough time for Scott Morrison to quickly bring forward his announcement so he could talk about opening the international borders to overseas travel. But that was about it. Mm. The business of staring down the uh, allegations of potential wrongdoing when they surfaced 12 months ago. So ICAC has been investigating Daryl Maguire, who is the member for Riverina or was the member for Riverina, for some time. Operation Keppel, it ran for a while. There were a series of investigations. Both public and private hearings were held. One of those private hearings was to hear evidence from Daryl Maguire and Gladys Berejiklian about their relationship. And it was the first that anyone heard that they had a relationship. They had been dating for five years without disclosing it. And during that period, millions of dollars in New South Wales funds had been given to the Riverina electorate for the Clay Shooting Association's facility down in the Riverina and the uh, a music hall, like an arts and, and theatre hall in the Riverina. That money had been asked for by Daryl Maguire. It had been turned down on the assessment by the independent planning authorities or the grants authority. Gladys stepped in. She was treasurer at the time. She chaired the meetings where these things were heard and decided. The money went to him. It allowed him to be re-elected because it was shown that he was doing stuff for the local community, like all of this kind of thing. But the part about the relationship, and this is where I think she was able to stare down that initial allegation and stare down those initial calls for her to step down because the part of the testimony in which they detailed their relationship was private and redacted and it wasn't made public and it's still not. If you go and take a look at the transcripts for the various sessions that were held in September and October last year, you'll find heavily redacted sections from the period where details of the relationship were given. But by accident, ICAC published a transcript of one of those private sessions, which included details that there was a relationship. And so that bit was out there. And then there were subsequently court orders handed down by the judge that said, look, you can't talk about it. But that particular cat was out of the bag and the Premier was forced to acknowledge that the relationship existed And a whole lot of people, including very close colleagues in Parliament, went, are you kidding me? I mean, the whiplash. I mean, I don't follow New South Wales state politics because I'm literally on the other side of the country. But that one did my, like, my jaw was on the ground over that one. That was, wait, what? That was insane. And I don't don't know what blew my mind more, that particular revelation or the fact that Gladys just just bluffed her way through it and wasn't taken down then. The reason she was able to, I think, was twofold. One was that that detail about the private relationship was redacted. 
it wasn't made public, just the existence of the relationship. And that allowed her to detail and release only as much as she wanted to. And as I say, it's still redacted. The second thing, though, was that she was able to say, I'm not the person of interest. Uh Daryl Maguire is. We're no longer in a relationship. Like the relationship ended a couple of weeks ago when I knew this was coming out, but the relationship has ended. And I'm not the one who's under investigation. It was him. And that That all changed on the 1st of October. Yes, when she became the person of interest. You are now the person of interest. (laughs) At which point you can no longer go, well, I didn't have to resign before because I wasn't the person of interest. It was this other guy. But now I am. It's a little hard to then bluff. And can I just say there were two things out of that revelation about the personal relationship that I, I, the first one I found entertaining, the second one I found infuriating. So the first one was when she said the relationship was not of sufficient status for me to tell anybody (laughs) about that. I mean, talk about a savage burn. (laughs) Yeah. So, Daryl, it's it's not us, it's you, and it's us, but really you're not worth it, is a hell of a, a hell of a public statement to lead with. What yes. was the second one? Oh, so this, the other thing that absolutely infuriated me was the narrative that then emerged from that and is continuing to this day of poor lovelorn Gladys who's got done over by a useless man. And because that narrative emerged yesterday with people in the media going, how terrible that her glittering political career has been brought down by a useless man. And it's yeah, like it's just a poor choice of boyfriend, basically. Yeah. yeah. And it's like And who again, who amongst us hasn't had a, a poor choice of, of boyfriend over the years, right? Like Oh my god, I have specialized in that. To end a career over that. Oof. Yeah. But I, what what infuriates me is the absolute erasure of her autonomy. Yes. Because on the one hand, you, you can't laud her for being a you know tough premier who fought for her people and tried to keep them safe during a pandemic and and made all these tough choices and did all this sort of stuff and then completely chop her off at the knees, erase her autonomy and say, oh, the poor dear just made a bad choice of boyfriend and got fucked over. It's not consistent, let's put it that way, but nor is it realistic. I mean, she's... 50-year-old woman with a career in politics who's risen to the highest position in the state, one of the most powerful positions in the country. The idea that this is all just a, a bad choice of boyfriend and it, it, it really wasn't her or even within her sort of control. It was it was all him and pandering and, and, and what am I meant to do about it? Like that's, that's not credible. Not even close, but you're right. Like it, I mean, it came up 12 months ago. It was in the Australian Today, like this idea that, well, poor woman, you know, who hasn't been let down by a man in the past is just, just absurd. It is. It, uh, it just makes me really angry. Because <laughs> once again, it, it's erasing women as credible leaders. You know, Gladys didn't attend the Women's March for Justice, did she? I don't believe she did, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's start there. So we've spoken about the response from media figures and some actually some surprising people coming out in support of Gladys Berejiklian in response to her resignation. Really some surprising people, and I won't name names, but suffice to say that some people that I would have said would hold her to account quite strongly have taken this opportunity to go, Oh well, what a what a shame and and poor Gladys that she's she's out. But Barry Cassidy, who is a, a well known media personality and is no longer active in the media, had some pretty strong things to say about all that over the last thirty six hours. Yes, I have to say that Barry is not having it, and I've got to say I'm here for Barry not having it. He's brilliant. Yes, he's really not happy. He's not happy with the resignation being blamed on the Independent Commission Against Corruption. He's not happy with the idea that it was all somebody else's fault, you know, like the whole love lawn thing. And he's definitely not happy with particularly some of his former ABC colleagues coming out in support of Gladys and 
this cleansing of her history and her uh, performance over her period w- without actually mentioning the fact that and she resigned in response to an investigation into corrupt conduct while she was in office. Can I just read you one of his tweets? Because Please um, do. The, the Twitter short form is, is he's mastered the Twitter short form. He is just basically murdering people in public now on Twitter. The very model of a successful multicultural story, says the ABC. Get a grip. She's quitting because of corruption investigations. What the hell has happened to scepticism, political standards? Well said. Mm. Well said. It is one of the really interesting takes over the last 24 hours or so in particular. And I guess we're at the the 30-hour mark since the news came out, give or take. But this idea that, you know, success story... Immigrant made goods, uh, woman rise to power, without mention of the abuse of power, the abuse of public trust, the corruption. And so far, like we haven't even touched on the fact that it was only this year that she was cleared of shredding all the documents relating to a quarter of a billion dollars in funding that was distributed to predominantly Liberal Party or Coalition Party electorates, community building grants program, I think it was called, but $250 million, which all of the submissions, electronic and hard copy, were accidentally shredded and deleted. There were no records for how that money was allocated. This is the same person, the same office, the office of, you know, like state archives described systemic failures in record keeping around the decisions that were being made. But essentially, at the end of the day, $250 million worth of public money in New South Wales was distributed out on what appeared to be purely political grounds. And there's no paper trail, nothing. Yeah, so, I mean, number one, rotting at that community grant straight out of the Morrison government playbook, for starters. And you, you make a really excellent point about the fact that the records apparently were destroyed. She was very credibly nicknamed Shredder on Twitter over that. And somehow everyone seems to have forgotten that. As I say, like the, the Office of State Archives identified systemic failures not just a one-off occurrence, but systemic or systematic failures on the part of the Premier's office to keep good records consistent with the, the, the relevant acts. That particular one related to quite a gross and obvious version of pork barrelling. And mm. I recall John Barillaro standing up there going, yeah, but that's just what we do. Like, we use public money to buy votes all the time, like we're politicians. What are you getting all upset about? It's mm. like corruption is the way we operate. I don't see why you're surprised being the short version of the Deputy Premier's version of events. Let's not forget that this is the Deputy Premier who nicknamed himself Pork Barillaro. Yeah. I mean. Which is actually a, an, an appropriate nickname and quite a good one. Mm. That's got political cartoon written all over it from here to the end of the earth kind of thing. Like that's mm. that's a really good name for him. Really good name. But the, the fact that he chose he chose to own it oh, yeah. is I mean that's real But he also owned the pork barreling as well. Well that's that's true, yes. Yeah. So the fact that he owned the pork barreling, owned the nickname that he gave himself over the pork barreling, it's a gigantic middle finger to his constituents. That this notion that we are being unreasonable by wanting government to be held accountable and to conduct itself openly and honestly and transparent, transparently and not wrought taxpayer money to keep themselves in power. Like, it's not even gaslighting. It's, it's I don't know what it is, no. but it's this, this notion that, like, apparently we're unreasonable over wanting that. It is a great big fuck you pardon the language, but the idea that the public should expect our politicians, our elected representatives, to carefully and diligently use public resources in the public interest, 
has been steadily eroded. Mm. You know, like that, and and that should just be a fundamental norm. It should be something that we can just expect that when you receive that position of authority and responsibility, that there is a degree of expectation that you will act with integrity, with honesty, in the public interest. And Barilaro is basically standing there going, tell him he's joking, straight up. And just just while we're on the hot takes thing, so it's Mm. not everybody at the ABC eulogising Gladys. Michael Rowland tweeted... I'm old enough to have covered politics when standards and integrity really counted. Those yeah. days have long gone. And the icing on the cake on that one was Greg Jericho retweeting mm. him and saying, and Michael isn't even that old. The slide no, can not. be very quick. Well, and if it's not stopped, it will continue. But the Australian Democrats have stood on the principles of accountability and integrity and transparency since Don Chip quit the Liberal Party in, in 1977. We have a very sort of detailed stance on political accountability. It covers things like donations, nepotism and jobs for the boys type thing, codes of conduct. But there's a section on conflicts of interest. So one of the key problems with Gladys Berejiklian's behaviour during that period where she was in a relationship with Daryl Maguire is that there was a conflict of interest. And in our section or in our, our platform on accountability, conflicts of interest says conflicts of interest should not just be declared. They should be rigorously avoided. Where this is not possible, the individual concerned must not have influence over decisions made and the conflict must be recorded on a publicly accessible register. They should apply to MPs and their staff, public servants, consultants, and government appointees. And that that in itself is such a departure from what we're seeing with Berejiklian's behaviour. She had a clear conflict of interest. She was providing, uh, presiding over funding hearings and grant applications that related to Daryl Maguire's electorate, where they were in a relationship which was not declared. She didn't recuse herself. She didn't declare the conflict of interest. She sure as hell wasn't avoiding it. She was doing everything she could not to make it public and then acting in a decision-making capacity, which actually benefited him both politically and maybe personally as well. It's a shame we don't have something like that at a federal level, because clearly we don't. And clearly the ministerial standards aren't up to scratch. Angus Taylor, who's just been promoted, going back a little way, started up a company with a friend of his. It was registered in the Cayman Islands for tax reasons, which is which basically means to avoid paying tax. When he was elected to parliament, he stood down as a director of the company, which is the right thing to do. But he subsequently brokered a deal whereby $80 million was paid to that company in exchange for water that didn't exist. Now, $80 million might sound like a lot of money. And to most people, it is. Huge amount. It is actually quite a bit of money. If I had $80 million, I would notice it. Angus sits there having brokered the deal to the company that he founded, which is held offshore so that, you know, like the, the idea that that didn't represent some kind of conflict of interest, he's just shrugged off. Mm-hmm. The prime minister shrugged off. Nothing to see here. Everything that occurred was above board. I have been assured of it. Is astonishing. And yet, like, that's the kind of thing that we want to see change. We want to see that slide reverse. Like, we, the Australian Democrats, want to see that kind of slide reverse. It's not normal. It's not okay. The idea that people in public office are lining their own pockets, aligning the pockets of their friends, aligning the pockets of their political donors is not actually normal. It's normal in Russia. It's normal in Hungary, which is a right-wing fascist country ruled by an oligarchy with a dictator in charge, 
that's not Australia. And it's certainly not the Australia that we want. And that's absolutely the direction that we all head if we allow this kind of thing to pass unchallenged and unchecked. Absolutely. And the the notion that a clear conflict of interest and, and the steps that you must take to avoid the, even the appearance of having a conflict of interest over a decision-making process that you are involved in, the fact that that is not carved in stone on the marble floor of the parliamentary foyer as a base standard that no politician should cross or ignore without dire consequences just baffles me. Like, how is that not already in place? And I think it's safe to say, well, it's not in place because it suits the people in power not to have it in place. This is why the government has been dragging its feet for over a thousand days now on implementing a federal ICAC. They got dragged kicking and screaming to the idea of implementing a federal ICAC anyway, and having notionally agreed to it, they've come up with this garbage proposal that you know, the experts who know about these things have said it's actually going to help cover up corruption rather than reveal it. It's going to protect the corrupt people rather than expose them. That's what's on offer for us as a federal ICAC from this government. And I mean, a federal ICAC, as we've just seen demonstrated in New South Wales, should be the absolute bare minimum for accountability, transparency and honesty in government. But what we need on top of that is all the things that are listed in our accountability plan. So proper codes of conduct, yep. a oversight and reform of minister of not just ministerial, but parliamentary salaries and entitlements, and that includes staffers. Everything we have listed that you just listed out in our accountability plan, the whole notion that you can go from a cushy ministerial role to a cushy role with an, an industry that you had oversight of when you were a minister, 30 seconds after you walk out the door of parliament, just unacceptable, but it happens. And somebody on Twitter, and, and like you, I have not kept track and therefore cannot credit them. They said that Gladys Berejiklian missed out on her premier pension by five months because yes. I think because New South Wales went through a period similar to the federal government, of going through a few premiers, they changed the rules. that I think you had to serve for five years as a premier before you got your pension. Yes. And in the past, a parliamentary pension was put into place because it was, at the time, it was difficult for former politicians to actually go and have a career outside of parliament once they were done because, for whatever reason, I mean, this is going back decades. But so guys having resigned early has missed out on getting that pension. Now, someone responded to the original tweet by going, yes, but really she shouldn't have it in the first place because, let's face it, it's probably not going to be difficult for her to go find a lucrative job once the ICAC thing is cleared and she's out of there. And that just says so much about our politics today. Yeah, I think it was Sophie Mirabella who was given quite a cushy job as a thank you mm -hmm. for being a Liberal Party faithful, the, the small business ombudsman, sorry, small business and family enterprise ombudsman currently at a federal level is Bruce Bilson. Some of you may not recognise that name, but Bruce was forced to stand down from federal politics under a cloud of corruption investigations, which was serious enough even for this government that he resigned only a few years later, he was installed as the small business ombudsman, which attracts a salary of, I, I think it's 350 odd thousand dollars a year, you know, which is good money if you can get it. Like this, this kind of thing just goes on and on and on. It's it's not okay. It's it's kind of remarkable that it happens, but it happens time and time again. Um, I want to touch on two things, though. You were talking about our accountability plan. You were talking about the sort of things that we we want to see and, and we need to expect. The, the notion of the independence of these uh, bodies is critically important. And that independence comes down to their mandate and how they're covered in legislation. And we've seen recently, only this week, the South Australian Parliament passed legislation to severely undermine the power of their independent commission against corruption. It was passed with unseemly haste through both houses of parliament. It was another of those 
oh, goody, if we can get this through, it was passed with almost unanimous support. It was passed on the basis of, oh, yeah, we really need them focus on this kind of thing rather than this other kind of thing so that we can go about doing the other kind of thing unimpeded. But the idea that the people who are being overseeing, the, the group that is under scrutiny can change the laws that govern what that scrutiny looks like is problematic. That's one thing. The second mm. thing is around funding. Funding of these bodies, be it the ICAC, be it the Ombudsman, be it sort of whistleblower protection groups, which we want to see federally, which don't currently exist. The National Audit Office is a good example of a group that over the last eight years has been progressively defunded by the federal government. Their funding has been reduced significantly so that their ability to conduct audits of those federal programs, how money is allocated, has been severely undermined. And this is the same group that put out the report earlier this year about the CARPORC scheme, you know, 600 odd million dollars in funding towards 40 odd projects in the lead up to the 2019 election, which again seems to have been almost entirely political. In a lot of cases, projects weren't submitted. Like it, it wasn't even necessarily on the basis of an application. It was on the basis of someone putting their hand up saying, can I have some money? It went to marginal seats. It went it went to seats that they were trying to win uh, off Labor. Um, it didn't necessarily go to projects that would actually deliver on what the scheme was for. Like the the report was scathing, and it came uh, a, a hair's breadth away from calling it outright corruption. But it, in very very strong language. They said, this is just not the way you spend public money. But the government that's being scrutinised keeps cutting their funding in the federal budget each year. That's something that we absolutely have to change. The ANAO, they are the unsung heroes that uncovered not just, you know, car, car parks. Car <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can get the it's word a great out. great name. Yes. Oh. But they uncovered sports rorts. They uncovered, yeah. I mean, I think uh, Michael Pascoe from the New Daily started totting up everything that the ANAO was uncovering in their audits in terms of stuff that was suspiciously rorted. Yes. And he, he had one article where he said, okay, I think we're up to $100 million now. Then he had a follow-up article a month later going, no, I was wrong. It's over a billion. Over a billion dollars to keep Morrison in power in 2019? I think it's significantly more than that by now. The most recent federal budget had at least, I think it might have been $2.6 billion, but it's been a while now and there's pandemic going on. But there was a significant amount of money allocated to unannounced projects, which is a really nice way of saying stuff that we haven't identified yet. Yes, and I think a really nice way of saying that's our taxpayer-funded war chest for the election. Yes, essentially. And again, for listeners, that kind of money tips elections in marginal seats. The allocation of $50 million, $60 million, $100 million into a critical piece of public infrastructure or something the community wants but doesn't need and doesn't need more than somebody else needs it, which is the critical point, can sway an election. Uh, a, an MP or a candidate standing in front of a big novelty check for $50 million to build a swimming pool or whatever it might be can absolutely tip the vote. And that's a misuse of public funds. It's not normal. It's not legal. It's not okay. It is absolutely using public money for party, party political gain. It's not something that we should accept. It's not something that we should say, well, both sides do it because they don't. We have to put a stop to it. And even if both sides did it, they shouldn't. Yeah, like, and either side should do it. Well, that's true yeah, enough. You know, there's this whole notion of, oh, well, the other guys are doing it. That, so that's not acceptable. 
And there's been a great deal of public discussion around the $18 million or so that Clive Palmer spent on advertising in the 2019 election, you know, purportedly for his United Australia Party and its candidates, in which he won no seats and no Senate places. But there is strong evidence that that $80 million alone helped tip, tip, tip the election in Morrison's favour. And people are rightly up in arms about that because... That it's unconscionable to have that amount of money sway an election. That is absolute peanuts in comparison to the amount of taxpayer money That's right. that the Morrison government used to ensure their re-election in 2019. Right. And if you think for a second that they are not gearing up to do exactly the same thing in the upcoming federal election, which we're just going to assume is going to be 2022, and in even greater volumes of money than they did in 2019, then I have a Harbour Bridge in your beautiful city that I could sell them. There are all the signs, all the signs are there that this is exactly the same approach that we're going to see in the 2022 election. And I agree with you, I think it will be next year because I don't think we're well enough or far enough distance from the pandemic to hold an election this side of Christmas. I think a summer of cricket and beaches and barbecues is something that Scott Morrison will want well and truly in the rearview mirror before he calls an election. As I said, like the budget had a whole bunch of these unannounced projects, big chunks of money. The Community Development Fund still has a few billion dollars in it. And that's been one of the key mechanisms by which this money has been channeled towards electorates where they want to see votes. Look, I've seen reporting that suggests that that community grants or community development fund has distributed something in the order of $4 billion now in ways that goes against any kind of assessment, the criteria are vague. The, The National Audit Office has a field day with that particular fund. It is so poorly managed it, in, in the sense that it doesn't allocate money on the basis of need. Decisions by the department and ratings by the department are consistently overruled by the minister's office. Those overrulings almost inevitably favour electorates that are coalition held or that they, they need to hold or that they want to win. All of this kind of stuff. But there is billions of dollars happening. And As I say, they continue to defund the groups who would otherwise provide any kind of oversight. I mean, you and I are both people who work in projects for a living. Apart from the corrupt and illegal misuse of taxpayer money that those community grants and other rorts represent, the other thing that really gets my goat is the really poor outcomes in terms of projects that those communities that are being rorted receive. The carparks, I think of 40 odd car parks that were proposed, only two of those projects have actually been started. So three years down the track, two car, you know, two congestion busting car parks have actually been built. And I can't remember how many of the other ones have been cancelled because they were not viable projects. And God knows what happened to that money. But the announcement was there. Those two were already underway by the local councils. They oh didn't need God. money. The See? only two that were delivered were already underway by the local councils. None of the other. And so, like, you sort of sit there and say, well, why are you upset about them allocating money to stuff that they didn't actually do? You can't sort of have it both ways. And I'm like, well, yeah, I can, because that money was tied up. It was allocated to projects that didn't need it, weren't ready for it, didn't deserve it and then subsequently wasn't used while projects that did need it were ready, could deliver the benefit that they were meant to, sat there unfunded. That's the the double whammy in all of this, Mm. is that not only do we have waste on one side for political gain, but communities that really need that help, that deserved and warranted that help, don't get it. Can you imagine the kind of country we would have if... That level of funding, and we are literally talking billions of dollars, but if that level of funding was allocated on the basis of actual need and actual value to the community, can you imagine how rich 
and vibrant a community we would have across the country, regardless of whether you live in a regional area or in a city. I had to laugh. A friend of mine sent a photo earlier in the week about the redevelopment that's underway at the North Sydney Swimming Pool. Now, the North Sydney Swimming Pool has been around for 100 years. It was last really renovated in 1936, I'm told. It sits nestled between the foot of the Harbour Bridge on the north side of the harbour there, nestled between the Harbour Bridge and Luna Park. It looks across under the bridge at the Opera House. So if you go and swim there, you're nestled between three of Sydney's most iconic locations in the heart of Sydney, and they are undergoing redevelopment right now. And the reason I mention it is that they received $10 $10 million in funding from the Regional Development Grant. So a, a swimming pool, just just processing this for a sec, a heritage swimming pool city that sits underneath the Harbour Bridge in the centre of the metropolis that is Sydney is somehow regional? Regional. It received money from the Regional Development Fund. Now, the Regional Development Fund was set up to do exactly that kind of thing, upgrade sporting facilities in communities across regional Australia. There was a particular idea that it would help upgrade women's sporting facilities in particular, like right across the country, sporting ovals, footy fields, cricket grounds, swimming pools, etc. It's often the women's change facilities that are either lacking or missing entirely. So a whole lot of teams a whole lot of clubs would love to see that kind of money. And if you go out into regional Australia, a lot less than $10 million is needed to upgrade the shower facility or upgrade the change room. But that money went to uh, North Sydney Swimming Pool. And the mayor of North Sydney said, but we get a lot of tourists who come and swim in our pool. And so we really are regional. And by that same logic, The Opera House is regional because so many international and tourists from regional Australia come and visit the Opera House. It could be regional as well. Centre Point Tower in Sydney could be regional. The Yarra River in Melbourne could be considered regional if, if that were the case. It's farcical, but this is what happens when you lack that kind of oversight. You know, like it it's it's absurd and it's obscene and it continues and we're going to see a lot more of it over the next 231 days and counting down until the next election has to be held. Yeah, it is beyond obscene. And one of the things that really offended me and really, I think, broke my heart when the sports fraud scandal hit was all these stories of these tiny sporting clubs, in particularly in regional areas, that were asking for $50,000 or $100,000, which for them was a huge amount of money, considering that their sporting club was running on on the blood, sweat and tears of volunteers and love of the club. To do something as simple as drain a footy field so they can can play all year round or build women's change rooms because I don't have any. Small things that would make a huge difference to a community for yeah. what is a tiny amount of money in the greatest scheme of things when you're talking about a $4 billion community grants fund. And the heartbreaking stories of the the enormous amount of work that these volunteers invested in filling out all the paperwork, justifying well, their need for that yeah. $50,000, everything that they went through to get their grant in front of the relevant authority to be approved and funded. And... They ended up on Bridget McKenzie's and Scott Morrison's magical colour-coded spreadsheet with scores, or like eligibility scores of like 97 out of 100 because there was a clear and pressing need for these things. Yeah. And they got overlooked and defunded in favour of places like a yacht club that had a, I think it was a yacht club. Reasons. Yeah. What's that, you a know, yacht club? Yeah. A, you know, a yacht club that got money to put in an elevator because they host functions. And, and and let's not forget that this whole the whole sports rorts investigation that has kicked off this cascading revelations around criminal levels of, of rorting in this government was mm-hmm. kicked off by the candidate Georgina Downer presenting a giant novelty check 
to the, yes. I think it's the, is it the Yankee, Yankee Aguila? That might be a walk of shame. Anyway, a bowling club. And the sitting member in that electorate, Rebecca Sharkey, yeah. wasn't invited, yeah. knew nothing about this grant that apparently was coming. But this giant novelty check had Georgina's name on it. It had the Liberal Party logo on it. And for all intents and purposes, looked like this unelected candidate from a political party that did not hold that seat had just awarded yeah. this bo- rich bowling club an yeah. amount of money that I can't actually remember how much it was. That was the um, the raindrop that triggered the avalanche of the yeah. depths of corruption in this government. And if yeah. we as an electorate, as I've said before, if we allow them to get away with this, you know, if, if, that's, what, if that's what you have to do to take and hold power, you just watch the Labor Party dive headfirst off that particular cliff. And, they and absolutely then, will. Yeah. So let me uh, let me quickly, it was Yankalilla. Thank you. Because Google's awesome. It was Yankalilla. It was $127,373. And it was club in Yankalilla. But it's it really is just wrong. Like the novelty check was Georgina Downer, candidate for Mayo, who was the Liberal Party logo in, in the corner. And it's our money, our money. It's taxpayer money. It's not their money. It's our money. Their logo has no place on it. None. Just like it has no place on vaccine ads. Just like it has no place on public health messages. It's not about them as a party. It's about the Australian government doing things on our behalf. Mm. And if that's not what they're doing, stop using our money to do it. Yes. I'll say this again. It's not unreasonable for the Australian people to want their government to spend their money on things that will benefit them as a community openly, transparently, and with a minimum of competence. Yeah. I was asked the other day by a colleague, why is it that our politicians are seemingly so bad at this? Are they really just that incompetent? And my response was... What they're good at is being re-elected. That's the thing that they've gotten good at. They've gotten good at being re-elected, and the rest of it doesn't matter. The part of it around public service, the part of it around public interest, the part of it around national interest, acting for their electorate, like all of that kind of stuff has been subjugated to this naked ambition to simply retain power, to simply be re-elected. It's one of the things I absolutely love about the voices for Indi and the voices for Australia movement that we're seeing, something like 30-odd independents, standing community candidates to run against these incumbent politicians who just seem to be in it for themselves. And look, when those independents are elected, and I hope that they all are, and I'm sure that many will be. I don't expect them to all agree with each other. I don't expect to agree with all of them. I expect them to have a diversity of views that is represented of the diversity of communities that they're there to represent. And that will be a lovely thing, because mm. at the moment, we've got this opaque, vanilla form of governance in which a very small number of positions ever see the light of day and we absolutely need that to change. The thing I find fascinating about the voices of movement, first of all, is that in most cases those groups are spearheaded by women and a lot of the candidates that are stepping up, like Kathy McGowan in Indi, who kicked all this off, like Helen Haynes, who replaced her as an independent in Indi, like Rebecca Sharkey. Like Zali Stegall. Thank you, yes. I just went blank on Zali's name. My apologies to Zali. All of those women, 10 or 20 years ago, would have been absolute star shoo-in candidates for the Liberal Party. They would have been... Liberal Party royalty in terms of their skills, their qualifications, their life experience. People would have written, you know, people like Phil Corey would have written gushing pieces about them in the AFR about these women being future prime ministers. Instead, they have been overlooked and marginalised by the party machine and 
they're being recruited by their communities to stand up and represent those communities properly. And that yeah. that's really telling. I love it. Me too. I absolutely love it. I, I love the, the message that it sends. I love the statement about our representative democracy. I love the ambition for what it means. I love the fact that those communities will be represented by someone from them, of them, for them, in a way that we so often don't see. Someone who will vote in their interests, first and foremost, like that's that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it won't be without its problems. The way in which the dynamics of the House of Representatives will change significantly with even a dozen independents on the crossbench, let alone 30. And if we see 30 independents on the crossbench, we are in for a hell of a ride over the next three or four years. It will be incredible to watch. Mm. But it absolutely sends a message to those larger parties, to the major parties, to the Nationals, to the Greens, to Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. It tells them that you need to do a much better job of representing the interests of the electorate that elected you rather than whatever the hell it is that your party wants and your donors want. Can I just shout out to the members of the Australian Democrats? Because so many of them, particularly the ones who have joined us over the last 12 to 18 months, they are also people who I think 10 or 20 years ago would have been, if not shoo-in star candidates for the Labor and Liberal parties or even the Greens, they would have been the hardworking backbones of the volunteer organisations in those parties that keep those parties going and help them formulate their policies, help them guide their values and everything else. And they're coming to us. And we have some extraordinary people in our party. And this notion that, oh, well, independents can't form government, I don't think that notion has been fully tested yet for a start. Not at all. So watch this space. Yes. But also the notion that you must hold an absolute majority in the House of Reps to get anything done. Well, first of all, Julie Gillard proved that you didn't. Everyone lost their minds over her having a minor government, but she passed more legislation and was a more effective leader of the country in some ways than the governments who had the luxury of being able to ram things through the lower house whenever they saw fit because you had to negotiate. And I think particularly with the immense challenges that this country faces over the next 10 years, the immense challenges that the world faces over the next 10 years for that matter, I think we would be really well served by whoever forms government in 2022 being forced to form government in minority and being forced to negotiate with the independents on the crossbench and then, with luck, the Australian Democrats in the Senate to pass legislation and do the right thing by the country. There will be an upcoming episode with myself and Lynn Allison on why the Senate in some ways is a thousand times more important than the House of Reps and why the Senate serves the, the nation so brilliantly. I'm really looking forward to that discussion because Lynn's very, very passionate about that, not because she's a former senator, but because sure. our system of government has been built with checks and balances in place and a strong Senate can protect a government from its worst foibles and protect the yeah. nation from bad government as well as empower a good government to do good. I look forward to that episode. Me too. Steve, I can't thank you enough for coming on it again at short notice because, again, this this all broke just yesterday. And, yes, ranting at me so eloquently about everything that is wrong in your poor, hard done by state of New South Wales. You guys are doing it tough. So much love to all of you. Thank you very much. I feel like we can't stress enough that the normalisation of corruption and dismissal of the mandate and imperative of ICAC is not normal and it is not okay. National correspondent to the Saturday paper, Mike Seckham, pointed out on the 7am podcast that it looks like New South Wales is somehow more corrupt or has more problems than the rest of the country. But he argued that actually no, New South Wales doesn't have a bigger corruption problem. What they have is higher standards. And this highlights the dearth of standards in the federal sphere. 
So one more shout out to the Australian National Audit Office for their tireless work in upholding what few standards of accountability there are for federal politicians and governments. And also a shout out to Independent Senator Rex Patrick for his work on holding the federal government to account. Thanks to Rex, the records of the National Cabinet have been thrown open to freedom of information when a federal judge in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal ruled that the National Cabinet is not a subset of the Federal Cabinet and is not subject to Cabinet confidentiality. But that saga and Scott Morrison's obsession with secrecy and lack of scrutiny is probably a subject for another episode. I can't wrap this up without acknowledging the ongoing events that have overtaken us again. Since recording, New South Wales Transport Minister Andrew Constance has also resigned from Parliament and is going to try his hand at federal politics by contesting the federal seat of Gilmore. And then New South Wales Nationals Leader and Deputy Premier John Pork Barillaro resigned from his leadership positions and from the Parliament, leaving New South Wales with, at last count, three by-elections to contest, and the Liberal National Coalition holds government in New South Wales with a one-seat majority. Not to get your hopes up, but none of those seats are likely to flip since they're on quite big margins. But stranger things have happened. Also, both parties in the coalition now have to elect new party leaders in order to restore political leadership to New South Wales. Poor New South Wales. It is perfectly okay to not be okay right now. You look after yourselves. I've put a link to our accountability platform in the show notes, and I must ask a huge favour of our listeners. If you like our platforms on things like accountability and you want to be able to vote for the Democrats in the upcoming federal election and help us return to Parliament, we need your help. As we discussed in our first episode, we now must demonstrate to the Australian Electoral Commission by December 2nd, 2021, that we have a minimum of 1,500 members in order to retain our registration as a party. Without registration, we can't contest the election and you won't be able to vote for us. So if you're not currently a member of a political party, please consider joining us, if for no other reason than to help us get the numbers we need. You can join for free with our supporter member option, and there's a link in the show notes to do just that. As our Twitter team says, do that, and you will attain instant new favourite status. The restoration of accountability, transparency, and honesty in politics is not going to happen without a concerted effort by we the people electing representatives that are committed to those values. So we really appreciate your support. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram by searching for Australian Democrats and you can see what we stand for, what we value and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>